want to include this in the video? Yeah, yeah. אז כולם מדברים עברית? אוקיי. אז תודה רבה לכם. It's better in English. מה? אתה מעדיף ב... If other students would like to see us. אוקיי. But up to you. אוקיי. So thank you all for coming to this week's uh, SPS uh, seminar and a special thanks to Dr. Ron Orenstein for accepting our invitation to speak to us. Uh, Dr. Orenstein received his bachelor's degree in computer science and electrical engineering from the Tel Aviv University. He then continued to get his master's in electrical engineering and his PhD in computer science, also from the Tel Aviv University. <coughs> he spent his postdoctoral training at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT and the Simmons Institute at UC Berkeley. At the present, Dr. Orenstein is a senior lecturer at Ben Gurion University, the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Engineering. Uh, today, Dr. Orenstein is going to present to us his research on the topic of deep learning and protein RNA interaction. Okay. Thank you very so much. Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, so this is a talk about deep learning for protein RNA interaction. First, I'll give credit to the student who has done the work, and this is uh, Ilan Ben Bassat, who's a PhD student, a uh, friend of both me and Ronen from the military service, uh, and his PhD supervisor, Ben Ishov. And I'll start with a biological introduction. I know that the crowd is computational, and I don't assume any prior knowledge in biology, so I'll start with a biological introduction, and I'll move on to the computational method that we use to solve. But uh, and starting uh, with the biological introduction, I present you here the double-stranded DNA. Uh, so what is a DNA? It's a piece of uh, information that is found in every cell of our body. This is called the genome in our body that contains all hereditary information, meaning the blueprint to construct a human being or a mouse or, or a fish or whatever organism. Is all this information is found in every single cell of our body. And the way this information is stored, similar to what we have in computers where we store information in bits, 0 or 1, in the DNA we store it with four symbols, A, C, G, and T. This is called the DNA, and this is a sort of a hard disk that contains all the information that can be used to create proteins, which are the functional elements in our cells. When a cell generates or creates a protein, it first translates a piece of the DNA into an RNA sequence, which is, has the similar property that it is over an alphabet of four letters. So we, computational people, see it as a sequence over four alphabet A, C, G, and you. Similar to when we run a process on a computer, we take it from the disk and it goes into the memory before it starts being executed. And then, this execution translation of the protein a recipe on the RNA becomes a real protein that performs some function in the cell. So this is how the cell works. This is the main paradigm in molecular biology in very uh, crude terms. Now, when we talk about an RNA molecule, which, as I told you, contains the information on how to generate a protein, it does not hold only sequence information, meaning a string over A, C, G, and U, it also has a structure. So imagine that you have a string over letters, but there is another piece of information overlaid on this piece of sequence. And the most useful structure that people are using in different studies is called RNA secondary structure. And this is folding of the, on the, of the letters <coughs> onto themselves. So for example, here we have the base pairing of nucleotides, which are the G's and C's can base pair, and the A and U's can base pair, and also we might see some U's and G's. And this base pairing, base pairing generates a sequence with some structure. So this is what we see here. So if I have to represent it computationally, I would have... Wow. Maybe. Oh, on this side? No, no, but, but a pen. Ah, okay. Black one? Black or red or whatever. So I would have some sequence, right? We know that this is a string in, that we can represent on a text file on our computer. And in addition, we are going to have base pairing of nucleotides. So with that would be a set of pairs so, for example, we can say that these A and U base pairs, so A1 and U2, and let's say these C, so the A in position 1 and U in position 2, and we can have C 
and G base pairing. So that is scene position four and G in position five. Right? So this is the type of information that we eventually have representing an RNA molecule, both the structure, the base pairing, and the sequence. But in many cases, it's not the exact base pairing that is important, but it is the functional units that are induced by a specific base pairing. So here I'm giving an example of the red pieces, which are helping loops. So if I'm interested in a function of a specific RNA sequence, I might ask not what is the specific base pairing, but what is the structural context. Herpin loop, pairing, paired loop, multi-loop, internal loop, and external region. So it's as if, instead of having the exact base pairing, now the type of information that I'm going to have is annotations over the sequence. So I can say that these A's and U's are as in a helping loop structural context, these are in a third structural context, these are in multi-loop, and these are in inner loop, for example. So we have a sequence and another piece of linear information on top of the sequence. And this is the, type, the, the way that we can represent an RNA structure because we are interested in the structural context of different sequence features. Just as we have context, in a text, right? The DNA or the RNA is a text that we learn, uh, we, read, we, learn, we read the text in a specific language. To understand the world in that text, we need the context of it. So similarly, on the RNA or the, on the RNA level, we have the structural context of a specific world, a short segment. And the appealing part of the secondary structure is that under some simplifying assumption, we can compute it in polynomial times. Specifically, if we allow only tree-like structures, we can compute it using dynamic programming. But the problem, uh, okay, before I move on, so as I told you, the main paradigm is that DNA moves to RNA by a process called transcription, and RNA translates to a protein, which is the functional element. The way that the cell controls these processes is by proteins that bind specific elements on the DNA or RNA level. So we have some proteins that bind the DNA, and by that they start the process. So we need some tech, the cell needs some mechanism, a regulatory mechanism, to tell when to start this process and at what levels of expression. So proteins that bind the DNA would start this process or, or stop it, and proteins that bind the RNA would start the translation proteins. Now what do proteins bind? So proteins would usually likes to bind a short piece of the RNA sequence, but it has to be also in a specific structural context. So for example, if I have this context, the GCG under a third context, I might have a protein binding here, and that would regulate this process. So this is the motivation why we are interested in having computation models that can tell us if a protein is going to bind here or not. But if this, is, this structural context is going to be helping loop, for example, we might have that the protein would not bind you anymore. So this type of information are important if we want to have uh, computational models that predict the binding of proteins both to the DNA or RNA. And the importance is found in almost any process in our cell because the regulation of our protein is translated and expressed is important for any process. If proteins are performing the function in our cell. And when I'm talking about protein RNA binding, so one uh, illustration could be that a protein, which is here this uh, semi-coil form, binds an RNA or DNA. Here it's the six-letter <coughs> binding site. And usually a protein has a site that it likes to bind the most. And let's say it's given some binding intensity. But if we change one letter here, you might see a binding intensity dropping to 80. If we see a different change in this letter from C to G, we might see a binding intensity of 50. And if we have two changes, we might see no intensity. So this is both the data that our algorithms are going to get as input, and both the <coughs> sequences and the numbers are the, uh, are the numbers that our algorithm needs to predict over new sequences. Now, what is the analog? So, for example, you might have a Netflix user who really likes to watch Breaking Bad. 
So he's giving it a, a, a score of 100. But maybe he likes other shows that are related to a, a narcotic trafficking, so he would like to see narcos. But he would give it a score of 80. And then maybe a different show, The Wire would be 50, but if, he, if we give him a comedy to watch, he wouldn't like it at all, and he would give him a score of 5. So similarly, proteins are the Netflix users who, want to watch, who like to watch movies. In our case, proteins like to bind DNA or RNA. And we want to have an algorithm that recommends the protein which sequences it would like to bind or wouldn't like to bind. So this is the computational problem uh, very generally. <coughs> and in the case of RNA, we, as I said, we also have the structural context. So binding also happens in some structural context. And here, for example, I might have the numbers in black representing the intensities under helping loop and the red numbers under paired context. Things get more complicated by the fact that this RNA sequence that I presented here can fold into many different structures. And in fact, since we have we can we can pair almost all pairs of nucleotides, the number of possible structures is exponential in the of the sequence. <laughs> so how do we deal with an exponential number of structures? And they differ by their probability. So we might have a set of representative structures can be represented as graph, graph abstract forms. So every nucleotide letter on the sequence is a node. And every edge connects between adjacent nucleotides or base pair nucleotides. Another viewpoint which we take in our study is the viewpoint that the for each position we give a distribution over the possible context. So now we accompany each sequence by a distribution. The nucleotide is accompanied by a distribution, given, for example, here 90% being in a paired context, 5% being in a helping loop or multi-loop, and 0% in the other two contexts. And these matrices can be generated by an algorithm. So I can run, take someone's software, run it on a given sequence, and it gives me these matrices that represents the ensemble of all possible <coughs> structures. And this is what we are going to do in our study. So what kind of data do we see in our algorithm? So the first <coughs> type of data measures protein RNA binding in vivo. The term in vivo stands for things that happen in a live cell environment. So the binding here is to protein binds the RNA in a cellular environment. And the output of this protocol, an experiment, that it's not me that I'm doing them, but other people are doing them, and I take available data, is a set of positives, set of sequences that the protein was binding. Could be between 50 to 100 nucleotides usually. And what I can generate in addition to the set of positives is a set of negatives. RNAs that are, I know that were transcribed in the cell, but were not bound by the protein. And now, as computational people, how do we call this problem? A classification problem. We need a model to distinguish between the positives and the negatives. And usually it would rely on small or short subsequences that represent the binding sites of the protein. But these protocols have some disadvantages. So for example, if I'm interested in learning about the RNA structure, I don't get it. I only have the sequence. So I can use an algorithm to predict it, but these algorithms are known to be unreliable for long RNA sequences in vivo. And these short sequences come from a longer RNA, thousands of nucleotides. There are also many cofactors and competing proteins. So for example, in a cellular environment, different proteins can compete on the same cellular binding site, or could be binding of two proteins together. And if I'm inter interested in what is known as the intrinsic binding preferences, meaning that the preferences of a single protein, and how it likes to bind, the cellular environment becomes very messy and distorts my signal. And last, there are many technological biases, which I will not go into, that happen in these protocols. So instead, people have invented protocols that measure protein RNA binding in vitro. The terms in vitro stands for in a tube. It's not a live environment, but it is a synthetic environment that we can measure. It's much cleaner than what we measure in the cell. So what they do here, they take a set of synthetic sequences. So imagine that I can write different sequences in a text file on the computer send it to some company, pay them some $1,000, and they send me back a set of RNA sequences which are completely synthetic. 
They don't come from any genome or, or species. They're short. They are short in this case, between 30 to 40 nucleotides, right? And in this protocol that is called RNA Compete, they were designed with a specific mathematical property that each word of length 9, there are 4 to the 9 such words, because the alphabet is of size 4, appears at least 16 times in the set of 240,000 probes. And you can imagine that <coughs> using the De Bruyne sequence, for example, we can generate such a sequence that covers all nightmares in it. So this is the set of sequences with the mathematical property. Some protocol measures the binding of the protein to that set, and eventually what we get in the output, we see a sequence and the binding intensity of a specific protein to each one of those sequences. So now I want a model that predicts an algorithm that predicts these numbers. So this becomes a regression problem, as opposed to the classification problem that we had before. This is one protein at a time, or you have yeah. a mix? It's a, a specific protein, a single protein. Okay. So it's a you much... Don't have, you don't have competition. Exactly. Much cleaner environment. I, uh, I can trust the measurements that are... Uh, it's a single protein that binds. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's one of the deep should mention. So f first, I'm interested in learning the structural preferences of the protein. And it is known that when I run an algorithm to predict the structure on these short sequences in vitro, they are, the predictions are quite reliable. It is a single protein, so no competition, no co-binding of different proteins. It's only a single protein in the, in the whole experiment, and there are less technological artifacts. So I'm one of the people who really like this kind of data. The machine learning people, I think, appreciate this data. It's in vitro, it's clean. There are so many measurements, right? 240,000. Uh, so, and each one is between 30 to 40 nucleotides. So, so that's really uh, at least a lot of data in, bio, in bioinformatics terms. But uh, they are short and they may not form the structure. Right. That's one of the advantages, and I'll show it in the results later on, that they might miss complex structures that exist in the real cellular environment. Yeah, so there's uh, still some work to be done, and that will be one of the results that I'll show. That, uh, we are unable to, to pick up the <laughs> complex structures uh, from this data. But that's the data for, data's fault, not our fault. Yeah. No, it's technology for creating long RNAs. The technology is limited. Yeah, I know. So RNA Bind and Seek from the lab of Chris Burge now produces synthetic RNAs of 120 nucleotides. Okay. So they are pushing it. Yep. This, is, this is between <laughs> 30 to 40. This is from the lab of Tim Hughes from the University of, of Toronto. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, technologies will improve and, and give us uh, longer sequences. So this is the data that we have, and one more thing that is appealing about it, there is a data set of more than 200 experiments, 244 experiments, and each of the experiments has 240,000 sequences. So lots of data to train and test our algorithm on. So this is the computational challenge that we went to solve to infer accurate sequence and structure based binding models from this experimental data. And this uh, was done with uh, ben Bassat, uh, Ilan Ben Bassat and Benny Shaw. It was uh, published uh, a couple of months ago in Bioinformatics and presented at ECC Big Conference. Okay, so before I go into the details, I'll give you the overview of where our algorithm fits. So what we do, we take an experimental data set of 240,000 probes with intensities, we send all the sequences to RNA structure prediction. This is an algorithm that someone else has written. Then what we give as input to our algorithm, and this is our contribution, are the sequence and intensities and probability vectors. I've shown you that now each nucleotide has a distribution of five numbers. Now we infer a binding model based on deep learning, and then when a, a, a researcher now gives us new sequences, we can take probabilities that were either experimentally measured or predicted and give it to our algorithm that can now predict these numbers. So this is the typical machine learning problem where we have to infer a model and then we can use the model to predict binding to new data points. Okay, so now, why do we need a new algorithm? What was missing in the literature before that? So D-Bind was a very uh, uh, pioneering work that was published in 2015 that used deep learning, the first work uh, that used deep learning to uh, look for sequence features 
that would allow us to predict protein DNA binding and RNA binding, but it missed the structure information. We had graph prot that was based on support vectors and graphical features, but it took more than seven days to run on each experimental data set. So that was too long when we run, want to run it on 244 experiments. RNA context that was published with the technology in 2010 represented the sequence and structure preferences by simple models. Uh, basically, it was a zero-order Markov model. And a work that I've done in my postdoc a couple of years ago uh, extended, R extended RNA context using uh, KML uh, scores, meaning scores for each word of length K, but still I didn't exploit deep learning, which is now revolutionizing the field of machine learning. So this is what we are going to do now, use deep learning to solve the problem of inferring the binding model of proteins to RNAs. So now I'm giving a short uh, overview or introduction to deep learning. I think most of the crowd here is computational, so you know about it. Uh, so what we are going to use in our study are convolutional neural nets. Uh, basically, they are designed to pick up uh, uh, local features, uh, very popular in image processing, image classification. They can pick up uh, features, local features in the image, and then pick up the interactions between them. Uh, for example, in this problem, it had to predict whether there is a dog, cat, boat, or bird. So imagine for our problem, they can predict whether there is binding or there isn't binding in a sequence, or at what intensity the binding occurred. And another architecture, which is very popular, are recurrent neural nets. And here, they are designed to uh, um, model text, textual context, so they can uh, keep a memory in each of one of these nodes and then uh, try to learn and predict the context of each word in the text. So we are going to use both of these architectures to predict protein on and binding. The building rocks that we are going to use are the convolution ones. So here it's a, a, a 2D convolution that goes both on the X and Y axis. And here we can take a kernel, which has the parameters that we want to learn, some weights, that we multiply over each offset in the input to get the output scores. Then we can apply rectification, meaning passing along only the positive scores that we got and uh, uh, setting to zero all the negative scores. In addition, we are going to perform max pooling, where we look at a certain number of scores and take the maximum from them, and eventually use a fully connected layer, where each neuron is a linear combination of all the input it's received and some activation function, usually ReLU, or sigmoid on it, and we have the output that goes into the other layer, eventually we'll have an output of size 1, which is the binding intensity that is predicted from the neural net. So how do we take the input, that is an RNA sequence, and give it to the neural net? First we perform what is called one not encoding. Each nucleotide is a letter from a four-letter alphabet, so we convert each letter to a four-bit vector, with one in the position corresponding to that nucleotide. In addition, we have the probability vectors that represents the structure of that sequence. Since it's already a matrix, we can give it as input to the neural net. So we can append both the one not encoding matrices and the probability vectors, which are of the same length, and give it to the neural net as the input. Here, instead of having four on L, L is the length of the sequence, and 5 on L, the concatenation would give 9 on L as the input to our neural net. Now going into the convolution neural net, so this is our input, the sequences and the ve probability vectors. We start with some technical padding, so we have all in the similar sizes. For example, if we uh, look at them as different channels, Right? If we look at images, we can have red channel, green channel, blue channel. Here we can look at it as the sequence channel and the structure channel. So we need to pad them so they are, have the same size. So we do the zero padding. So what size end. of uh, this array? Yeah, so like uh, like the image in, uh, in the usual scene, one size is 16? L, that's going to be the length of the sequence, which is between 30 to 40. Yes. So we need to pad everything to 40, so they're yes. the same. And, and other yeah. size. And we have four nucleotides, so the one not encoding is going to be size 4. 
and five structural contexts, so that's going to be five. So each image is again? Uh, so it's as if we have uh, two uh, channels. W one channel, one image, w what size is it? So we have a sequence over ACGU of length L, where L is between 30 to 40. Okay. So then it's going to be 4 on 40. Okay. We take the max. And the other channel, which is the structure, this is the sequence. And the structure is going to be 5 on 40. Okay. And can you remind what is in structure? Yeah, so the this structure... This is H uh, and so on? What's exactly. The, what? These are the probabilities here. This is the, st the structure. Probabilities of being in this position... Yeah, exactly. Uh, which these annotations. Yeah. Which you have seen. Okay. Reduce these probabilities already in some kind of structural <coughs> context is taken into account? Yeah. Is it per nucleotide or is for each sequence? Yeah. So it, it is per nucleotides, and maybe that's one of the disadvantages of this viewpoint because they lose the dependency between different nucleotides. Because so imagine if one is, is in herping, the other should be in helping as well. But we lose this information when we take this viewpoint. So this is for future usage. Yeah. There are ways to predict uh, the probabilities not for a single nucleotide, but for a stretch of nucleotides. Uh, for example, you can predict if, if three nucleotides which are adjacent are in some structural context. And you can get this, the probabilities from these algorithms. But I tried those in, in my work, in my postdoc, and they didn't improve. They even made things worse for the prediction. So the, then uh, one size would be 40, and, but the other size, in, instead of four, may be larger. It may yeah, include triplets, for example. Yeah, yeah. So four to four. Uh, yeah, and the how many triplets? Yeah. Well, it's still number of triplets still, still maybe forty because you ah, you right. you take neighbors of each. forty minus three plus one. Yes, is yes, all yes. But uh, yeah. other size would be larger. No, it's still because five. it's for for triplet. No, because you still what the probability that you're going to get is whether this triplet was in a hairpin. A multi loop, so it's oh, okay. Still so, this second image, but the first image, the first picture, yeah, yeah, we will be larger. It's all three. Ah, if you want to consider cameras, so you can take the features as a, a four to the three, right? All possible. Two, two okay. So, I mean, those kernels now I'm going to show the kernels that work on this level are, are equivalent to zero order. Markov models, right? They take each nucleotide and they have additive weights. And if you want to remember what was the previous nucleotide, we need one order Markov model or two order Markov model going into triplets. Uh, we don't have that, right? With the kernels that are currently implemented. But it's number, now. it's not huge. It's still feasible for. Yeah, yeah definitely. So I can convert the alphabet into triplets and then run the neural net and see. And there are works that have done it and shown that you can pick something in the dependency between two positions. Okay. But being a convolutional neural network, couldn't it pick it up by itself? It doesn't assume they're independent. It doesn't. No, but it. using a kernel, you can only you you. It's additive weights for each position. Because a, a kernel is like a matrix. If you have one zero 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 one zero zero, then you have different weights. W one, W two, W three, W four. You multiply W one by this one. Then in this column, you multiply different weights by this one. But if you had a different one, it wouldn't change the other weights. So, given that this is the representation of the sequence, you cannot model dependency. You can have different kernels, and then maybe the different kernels would pick up different binding modes, but what you can do for a solution is instead of representing nucleotides, you represent dinucleotides, meaning pairs of nucleotides, then the alphabet goes from 4 to 16. So that's one possible solution. Yeah, it picks up some of the structure yeah. is already yeah. strongly dependent and was solved by dependencies. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so the structure it does look at, at the dependencies and some interactions between those base pairs, so it already picks some of the information. And I'm going to show if the, uh, you uh, later on if the structure gives us any information at all. Maybe everything is already in the sequence, because as I remind you, the structure is predicted from sequence. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's already in the sequence, and we don't need it. Uh, but that will be one of the results that I show. Uh, 
Okay, so while we do this technical uh, padding, and then once we have the uh, input sorted, we give it to a convolution and ReLU. I think uh, we used uh, 128 uh, uh, five, um, five width uh, kernels and 128 11 width kernels. I talk about why later. Then we do the uh, pull uh, ReLU pooling and one fully connected layer at the end. So it's the typical uh, convolution, uh, maybe even uh, very shallow, right? And when we look at the uh, deep learning <coughs> convolution neural nets for images, they are much more deep, right? Yes. The different layers of convolution, and here it's only three layers. So would you consider it deep? No. It's not. <laughs> but what you say... I, I've seen a definition of if it's two layers or more, it's, it's, it can be called deep. But, a, but yes, that's what we have in bioinformatics, and it's enough to give very good predictions. It's in your experience. In your in, in increased depths, you, you don't gain... Yeah, yeah, and you there is a wall that shows, yeah, you don't gain much by the... Uh, so I, I had so a question about the uh, sequence to stack geometry. It's a many-to-many -many problem. When we try and to predict... When you, when you narrow it, the, the, the combinatorics is under conditions. You must, you impose, like when you say it's synthetic environment, uh, you already impose some conditions that you narrow the dimension of the space, of this many-to-many -many method. But basically, it's a many to many. It's a, the computation, you don't have even an idea what is the computational complexity of this general problem of the sequence to structure. Method. Of predicting the, the structure from the yeah. sequence? Yeah. So, under some uh, simplifying assumption that this, the structures fold into tree like structures, okay. we can compute it using dynamic programming. Okay, so this under a certain. Yeah, otherwise it's NP half. Yeah. yeah. Computing the optimal structure. Yeah. Thanks. But we, we in our in our work, we just use it as an algorithm that someone has developed, and we are using it to get the numbers. And other deep learning kind of algorithms? No, based to, on to the dynamic programming. So it's combinatorial. No, no, yeah. no other methods which try. Actually, to we have a new work which is under review using deep learning to do these numbers. Okay. But uh, it's a different story, which I'm not going to present today. Uh, another architecture that we tried were current neural nets. <coughs> so here uh, we appended, uh, but we can still view it as different challenges or appending of the challenge that would be the same. It would be equivalent mathematically. We appended the input. Uh, we gave it, uh, we did a technical padding. We gave it to two recurrent neural nets, bidirectional, so we can compute the effect of the context from both directions of the sequence and a fully connected layer, and eventually a single output. And these are the two architectures that we used in Pi. A few technical details. So we used the TensorFlow Python package, but since then I, I, uh, we moved to Keras, and it's much simpler. Uh, the optimizer algorithm that we used was ADAM, the MSC loss function, which is very typically, typically used uh, for regression, minimizing the mini squared error loss and some regularization, which is the L2 that we used. We ran it on, on the Intel Xeon CPU, 